Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Adult Issues webinar series, Webinar 1, on the Introduction to Adult Issues in Autism Spectrum Disorders. My name is Jill Harris, and I'm the Clinical Liaison at the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence, also known as NJACE. NJACE is a statewide, innovative, comprehensive, and collaborative network to promote quality research, professional training, and build public awareness aimed to improve the lives of individuals with autism across the lifespan. The center is funded by a grant from the New Jersey Department of Health, Governor's Council for Medical Research and Treatment of Autism, to Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, with partnership from Children's Specialized Hospital. To learn more about NJACE, the resources, activities, and goals, please visit our website at www.njace.us. The Adult Issues webinar series is designed to build understanding and skills of people with autism from transition to adulthood throughout the lifespan. The series is intended for adults with ASD, families, friends, service providers, and the general community. Topics and experts were chosen based on input from various stakeholders, including autistic adults, caregivers, and providers. Some things to remember as we continue. On the right side of your browser, you'll see a chat box that might look something like this. In order to participate in the YouTube live chat, you must sign into your Google or YouTube account. Here is what the sign in button looks like for both desktop and mobile YouTube clients. Once you click on that button, YouTube should redirect you to the appropriate login page and afterward will redirect you back to the live stream where you can now chat and ask questions to our presenters. As time permits, the presenters will address your questions at the end of their presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded, and the recording of this webinar will be provided at a later date on our website under the Resources, Webinars by NJACE tab. Please check back in a few days for the recording and feel free to share with anyone. We'll also be putting a webinar evaluation link on the YouTube live chat box for participants to complete. The evaluations will help us gauge interest and suggestions for trainers and topics for future webinars, so please fill them out. The evaluation is also on our website under the Resources, Webinars by NJACE tab for you to complete there if you prefer. With that, we're pleased to welcome our speakers for today, Carrie Magro and Amy Gravino. Carrie is, Hi, everyone. <laughs> there he is. Carrie is an award-winning professional speaker and best-selling author who is on the autism spectrum. He started professional speaking eight years ago via the National Speakers Association and has presented at over 800 events. In addition, Kerry is CEO and president of KFM Making a Difference, a nonprofit organization that hosts inclusion events and has provided 60 college scholarships for students with autism. In his spare time, he hosts a Facebook page called A Special Community that now has over 160,000 Facebook followers, where Kerry does on-camera interviews highlighting people impacted by a diagnosis. His videos have been watched over 25 million times. Kerry is also a best-selling author and has been featured in the media. And for more information on Kerry, please visit our website. Amy Gravino is a certified autism specialist and international speaker. As the founder and president of ASCOT Consulting, Amy offers autism consulting and college coaching services for individuals on the spectrum, mentoring services for young adults with autism, and professional presentations for conferences, autism events, schools, and professional development workshops. Amy has given two TED Talks, spoken twice at the United Nations for World Autism Awareness Day, and is featured in a Condé Nast video, What Women with Autism Want You to Know, that has reached over 1.5 million views on YouTube. Amy serves on the board of director, directors of Special Listerna USA, Yes She Can Incorporated, and the Golden Door International Film Festival of Jersey City, and is co-facilitator facilitator, sorry, of the Morris County chapter of Aspen, New Jersey. Amy is now authoring The Naughty Audie, a memoir of her experiences with dating, relationships, and sexuality from the first-handed perspective of a woman on the autism spectrum. And for more information on Amy, please also visit our website. Thank you so much for that great introduction. I'm Amy Gravino. And I'm Carrie Magra. And this is Introduction to Autism Spectrum Disorders. 
So just to share a little bit with you about me and my background, I am the founder and president of Ascot Consulting, which I started in 2010 as a college coach for students on the spectrum, but I also now do mentoring for young adults on the spectrum and families. Um, and I'm also a consultant for school districts and families and individuals as well. I'm an international speaker. I've given two TED Talks and spoken in the United Nations. I primarily present on autism and sexuality. And in that vein, um, I would like to share a little video with you that was done as an interview with me with uh, NorthJersey.com last year that talks about my work with autism and sexuality. Well, I've always been very open about sexuality. So I, I have been called by others and by myself the Dr. Ruth of the autism world. There isn't someone really who's speaking about autism and sexuality, very frankly, and especially a woman, I think, is a voice that's needed. And so it's important we hear from a female perspective. There's been such a need to have these issues talked about because they are so under-addressed um, in the autism community and outside the autism community. So it's just become something that I've become very passionate about. And when I speak, I talk about my own experiences and I speak very openly. And I think that's, that's what reaches people the most is hearing from someone who is on the spectrum speaking honestly about their life. And I think it's able to open people's minds and hearts. There's an unfortunate stereotype that perpetuates that people with autism are incapable of love, cannot give love or show love, and this is simply not true. Uh, we, are, we are quite frankly full of love, but it's a matter of finding someone who's worthy of that love and who will respect it and honor it as we deserve. Uh, we may not show affection in the same ways as neurotypical people, but we are still capable of demonstrating it in our own way. So I'm currently writing my first book, uh, the Naughty Audi. It is a memoir of my experiences with dating and relationships as a woman on the autism spectrum. So I wanted to share uh, the experiences that I've had, uh, the trials and tribulations that I've gone through in my life trying to date, trying to make that elusive connection that we all want to make with another person, and just the kind of interesting twists that autism has given to those experiences and the challenges that have come out of being autistic and trying to date. Um, which a lot of people may find is not so different from being typical and trying to date. Uh, so I would like people to see through the book that as different as we may be, we are actually a lot alike, um, more than people may realize. And I hope that we can be embraced and accepted for who we are, because that's all any of us really wants, is to be accepted and loved for who we are. And now I'll turn it over to Kerry, who will tell you a little bit about himself. Our next guest is an accomplished public speaker and activist who has devoted his life to helping others. Not bad for a guy who was completely nonverbal for the first few years of his life. But once Kerry Magro found his voice, he had a lot to say. My parents have always told me I'm special, so why am I special? And then later on, I realized that I'm even more special because I have autism. Kerry Magro's childhood was marked with rough patches. He was completely nonverbal at age two and diagnosed with autism at age four. I just remember um, having difficulties trying to explain myself to the world around me. When Kerry did speak, he struggled to express himself. Most of my memories were simply just about that kid who wanted to communicate with the world around him, but didn't have the verbal means of actually doing that. His mother, Suzanne, remembers watching her son have a hard time adjusting to the outside world. He turned two and he was scared of everything. He was scared of the water, he was scared of the rain. But as the years went on, Kerry slowly began to find his words. When you can't communicate with the people you love the most in this world about even some of your basic needs, it gets really, really tough. So, but luckily, <laughs> once I started talking, <laughs> I never stopped talking. <laughs> Kerry went on to graduate high school, attend Seton Hall University, and then independent living. Today, Kerry is a professional speaker, activist, and mentor dedicated to educating people about autism. Wow. This is a tough one today. Kerry is currently finishing up his doctorate in education while also writing a children's book about autism acceptance in addition to his public speaking. Good for him. We'll be right back. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Carrie Magro, and I'm so honored to be here to talk to you a little bit about autism today. I was nonverbal until I was two and a half, diagnosed with pervasive developmental disorder, and otherwise specified at four, and dealt with uh, countless challenges uh, growing up, mainly communication and sensory based. But uh, because of the support of my village, I was able to overcome many of my obstacles to today being a professional speaker via a speaker bureau called the National Speakers Association for the past nine years getting to travel across the country to not only talk about autism but talk about inclusion bullying perfection and the power of positivity in our communities this has given me the opportunity to write several books based on my journey growing up on the autism spectrum to be able to consult on several films to bring a realistic portrayal of autism to our entertainment industry and in my spare time <laughs> getting the opportunity to have a nonprofit organization called KFM Making a Difference, where we provide mentoring, coaching, and training for individuals with special needs across their lifespan, uh, while also providing scholarship opportunities for students with autism to go to college. Uh, being able to now say that we've given over 60 scholarships for students with autism to go to college in uh, the, the, the past seven years. So, Right now, I'm going to just break down a little bit about what autism spectrum disorders are. The most interesting thing that has become part of this autism spectrum movement has been based on the DSM-5 actually indicating that uh, there's only now one uh, diagnosis of autism in autism spectrum disorder. And autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder. It's pervasive and it's heterogeneous. And one of the biggest things we really need to focus on as a community is indicating that autism is a lifelong disorder. Now, the formal definition of autism, and there are many definitions of autism out there, but autism in itself is still focused as a social and communication disorder. And it's a very, very wide spectrum. Now, one of my dear friends in the autism community is an amazing speaker called Dr. Stephen Shore, who himself has autism and quoted uh, this quote where he says, if you met one individual with autism, you met just that one individual with autism. There are a very wide range of levels of severity in our autism community. For individuals such as myself and, and Amy, who might be able to speak in a webinar such as this, but then there are going to be other individuals with autism who might have a severe diagnosis of autism who might need lifetime care. Uh, some individuals may be nonverbal. Some may uh, need other services as well to progress. And some of the symptoms of autism are indicated here in the slide, but social communication challenges, repetitive behaviors. Some individuals might have difficulties with sensory issues. Some may have difficulties with recognizing emotions, uh, lack of eye contact, and facial expressions. Uh, but in our autism community, one of the things that we talk a lot about is not being prone to the deficit model. We need to focus on people's strengths as much as we focus on their challenges and their weaknesses. So some of the strengths that can come with an autism diagnosis are a laser focus when it comes to key interests, especially for long periods of time. They may excel in academic areas that do not rely heavily on social interaction. Uh, some individuals with autism might be very detail oriented. Some of them might be very authentic, honest, and loyal as well. So I wanted to break down right now. So one of the things we often say is that early ear infection truly is the key for individuals in our autism community. And one of the most important things that we can truly focus on, especially when we're focusing on early access to care, is making sure people are aware of the early signs of autism. These are just a few things that can indicate an autism diagnosis, especially in uh, younger individuals. Things such as no big smiles or joyful expressions by six months or thereafter. Uh, no back and forth 
sharing smiles or facial expressions by nine months. Uh, no back and forth gestures by 12 months. Uh, no babbling by 12 months as well. Uh, no meaningful two word phrases by 24 months. Uh, preoccupation with parts of objects or toys repeats uh, unusual movements or action, and also any loss of speech or social skills at any age, uh, also known as regression. One of the great things that we now know about autism is that we can detect autism as early as 18 months now, and we can detect early signs of autism as early as six months. So one of the huge things that's going on in our autism community today is that autism is actually one of the fastest growing developmental disabilities in our country, rising over 100% in the past decade. When I was diagnosed with autism, the numbers of autism in the United States were one in every 1,000. And today it's one in 59, which actually makes up 1% of our U.S. population, about over 3.5 million Americans currently having some form of autism. Autism is four times more prevalent in boys than girls today. Uh, and unfortunately, and Amy will actually talk a little bit about uh, girl autism later in this presentation, but uh, a lot of girls on the autism spectrum are unfortunately falling through the cracks today in terms of getting that formal diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And one of uh, the, another big challenge we're seeing today is uh, what happens to children with autism when they become adults? Over 500,000 children with autism will reach adulthood within the next decade. Uh, studies have indicated from groups such as the Interactive Autism Network that 35% of people with autism will not go to college. The majority of individuals with autism who are adults today are unemployed or underemployed. 63% uh, of children with autism. Uh, Thank you so much for that great introduction are bullied uh, recurrently. 81% uh, of adults with autism still live with their aging parents. And one of the statistics we're seeing a lot more prevalent, and especially in the mainstream media, is the topic of wandering. About uh, half of individuals with autism who wander uh, from uh, their families and unfortunately go missing as a result. And in terms of the causes of autism, this is a question we receive almost the most frequently. And today there's no medical detection or cure for autism. And what we do know is there's truly no one cause of autism. And over time, experts have indicated causes in relationship to things such as environmental factors, uh, advanced parent age, both on the father and mother uh, side, uh, pregnancy and birth complications, and also uh, genetics. One thing that we truly have seen, though, is because of this increase in prevalence, so many people say it's an environmental, it's a genetic. But one thing that all experts can truly agree on is that there truly is more awareness. We live in a digital age where there are more opportunities for us to actually be able to detect things such as autism, especially when we're talking about the early signs. So less individuals are truly falling through the cracks uh, because of this. So, and now we are going to be transitioning to Amy, who will be talking a little bit about uh, autism in adulthood, along with several other topics. Amy, take it away. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you for a riveting portion of your presentation. Just a note on Carrie's mention about bullying. That's only the percentage of individuals on the spectrum, children who report bullying. Uh, I would venture to guess that the actual numbers are much higher because so many autistic children don't even know what bullying is necessarily or conflate bullying with friendship. And so how much bullying goes unreported, we don't know. Um, and speaking of what we don't know, we don't know how many autistic adults there are. Um, so much of what Carrie just discussed is based on children. It's, it's the, the predominant image of autism as it exists now today in the United States is as a childhood condition. Uh, but what happens to autistic children? They become autistic adults. Big shocker, right? Nobody saw that coming, apparently, because we've devoted so much of our resources and our energy and our research to children that we've entirely neglected this population of autistic adults who have been here all along. 
and who need that focus on them. Um, but there has been no actual longitudinal study that indicates how many autistic adults there are in the country. So we, we don't know. As a result of this, as a result of this dominant image of autism as a childhood condition, so many children on the spectrum end up falling off a cliff, is the expression, when they reach age 21, because that's when they age out of services that are offered by the school district. They're no longer qualifying for services for the IEP, and there is a complete dearth of services for adults on the spectrum. Um, overwhelmingly, the services, the support groups, the research, everything that you see is geared toward children or parents of children on the autism spectrum. Um, if you look in most of the, the, the behavior analytic research or in any of the other journals, it's still predominantly focused on children, which is a real big problem because as, as a result, we don't know what aging looks like with autism. What, what challenges do autistic people experience as they age? We don't know about how autistic people face hormonal changes, not just with puberty, but also with menopause, right? That's gonna happen as we get older and we have no research on this. So as a consequence, we have a really, really incomplete and fractured picture of autism and adults. So we don't know exactly what, what, a per, what an adult on the spectrum looks like. Um, but the picture that we do have, as Carrie mentioned, is not so good with the very high unemployment and with a lot of other kind of grim things that are the reality right now. But we're going to change that. That's what we're here for. There are a lot of misconceptions about autism. And a lot of these need to be cleared up because these perpetuate unfortunate stereotypes and they prevent the conversation from shifting to autistic children to autistic adults in a really meaningful and significant way. So the first the biggest misconception by, by far is that autism is caused by vaccines. Uh, this has been going on for a long, long time. A researcher by the name of Dr. Andrew Wakefield conducted a study many years ago that was fortunately conducted. It was published in a journal called The Lancet, where he uh, connected autism to vaccines, and he has been discredited since then. The, the journal has retracted the study, but the effects have gone on. You know, once the rabbit's out of the hat, it ain't going back in. So we see the consequence of that to this day, whereby there's a great deal of panic when it comes to vaccines and there's a great deal of misinformation about vaccines that is out there. Um, and it's, it's all based on this one misconception that started long ago. Uh, really, you know, the focus as Carrie mentioned, there's a big genetic component that we're looking at, we're looking at environment, but vaccines do not cause autism point blank period. Please get that tattooed on your forehead if you have to, to remember it. Okay. The second misconception about autism, another big one, is that autistic adults are kids in big bodies. So how many times do you hear the expression, uh, he's a 25-year-old, but with the, with the mental age of a five-year-old? No, no. A 25-year-old with autism is a 25-year-old with autism. He just may have challenges that cause him to process things differently, to deal with things differently. But by infantilizing autistic adults, we create real problems because our bodies don't care that we have autism. We're going to go through puberty. We're going to go through the same physical changes as neurotypical peers. And we're going to have the same kind of needs as other adults. But those needs often don't get met because many autistic adults are treated like they're just kids in bigger bodies. And it's it's dehumanizing um, and it's wrong. And so that's a misconception that we really need to dispel. Um, and again, uh, kind of tied to that and to what I've said already, another misconception that autism only affects children. Um, this is again the result of that image that is all over the place that we're seeing even in TV shows in the media. Most of the people that we see are young people. They're at, at the most they're in their 20s, but there are so many people on the spectrum who are, are much older than that and we just never see them. Um, so this, cre this, this adds to that perception that autism only affects kids. And um, finally, another misconception, and Carrie touched on this a little bit, I'm gonna go into this a little bit more now, that there are more boys than girls who have autism. Um, the diagnosis ratio would bear that out, the, the four to one ratio, but that is just simply to do with the diagnostic criteria that we use to diagnose autism. Those were developed by observing boys, and so that's what people are looking for, but girls, you know, autism shows up differently in girls than it does in boys in a lot of cases, and because it's not what people are looking for, girls and women end up slipping through the cracks. And so, as I said, you know, that ratio just does not accurately reflect how many autistic women there are. Um, I myself was diagnosed at age 11. I got lucky in some ways 
because so many of the women that I know were not diagnosed till they were in their 30s, 40s, 50s, you know, and even beyond. And so many women are misdiagnosed as well, be it with bipolar disorder, with ADHD, with um, depression, whatever it may be, um, because people are not thinking of the autism diagnosis, right? So this is a big problem for autistic girls and women who are not getting this, the supports and the services that they need because they're not being diagnosed properly. Um, and of course that's connected to a larger issue with women's health in general being ignored or not taken seriously by medical professionals, but that's a whole other issue. We could do a whole webinar on that. But the, the consequence of girls and women, you know, not being diagnosed is that they are falling to the cracks as Carrie said, and not, and we're not getting the supports that we need. Um, and again, as I said, autism presents differently in girls and women. Again, we are socialized in our society very differently the way from boys are. So girls and women are able to mask a lot more their behaviors. The, the, the girls engage in more imitation by watching their neurotypical peers. Um, and that's able to kind of conceal some of the symptoms, but they're still there. Just because somebody can, can blend in or mask in some ways, it doesn't mean they stop being autistic. And a lot of people think that, and it's not so. And finally, one of the, one of the greatest challenges for girls and women is that the spaces that do exist for support, support groups, for example, are often male dominated. And I speak to this from firsthand experience, going into a support group that was largely occupied by men, and I was either hit on or I was treated like an alien. And I'm not here for either one of those things. I, I'm here to get support just like you, but it's very hard in that kind of an environment. So there have started to be more spaces that are, autist that are girl and women centric for women on the spectrum, which is great, like Felicity House in New York City, is one and there's another group for women that was started uh, by a woman on the spectrum. So these things are starting to exist, but without them for so long, it has been a real struggle for girls and women to get those supports and to be acknowledged and you know, say, yes, you are on the spectrum. How can we help you? How can we make a difference? So these are just some of the challenges that are faced by autistic girls and women. So now me and Amy are gonna talk a little bit about what helped us when it came to uh, therapy services and just overall uh, towards our journey uh, into adulthood. Uh, and I was nonverbal until I was two and a half, uh, like the video mentioned, and diagnosed with uh, PDD and OS at four. And right away, one of the, 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 the things that helped tremendously were my parents truly realizing that I wasn't my diagnosis. I, I was much, I, I was Carrie. I was a person with autism. Uh, even though I was considered on the severe end, my parents always tried to emphasize strengths and reward systems and a positivity factor, especially in the households. Because I kid you not, working with kids around the country with autism and special needs, one of the things that I constantly am, am told by them is that they feel like they have a nine to five job when they go into early interventions, when they are receiving these therapies. So we definitely need to do a better job of making sure these kids utilize their strengths and what their talents are. Temple Grandin, who's a phenomenal autism advocate who also herself has autism, says that interests and talents can turn into careers. And I think that overall theme was something that helped me tremendously throughout my life to get me to the point where I am today. 15 years of occupational speech and physical therapy when I was originally diagnosed all the way till graduating high school were pivotal, actually starting out with 15 hours of that weekly and then slowly trickling down to just a little a uh, bit over three hours uh, a, a week uh, going into my high school senior year. Uh, interests and talents can turn into careers and the two therapies that turned uh, into some of the biggest loves of my life were music and theater therapy. I grew up wanting to be the sixth member of the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> and music became a, uh, a, a love of my life. When I was having difficulties with loud noises due to sensory challenges, there was always something about music. So my parents got me involved with music therapy. And later on, they realized I couldn't sing. I realized that as well. And I got involved with theater therapy as a way of building on my communication abilities 
but also understanding the perspectives of others. One thing that sometimes happens uh, for individuals with autism is that sometimes they have tunnel vision where they're not able to focus on the perspectives of others. So I would highly recommend theater therapy for individuals with autism. Uh, reward systems in the household. My parents had a coin system when I was four years old, uh, which actually helped a lot also with difficulties with being a picky eater. Uh, I told my parents every single meal till I was eight years old, I wanted a bologna sandwich for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And my parents used a point system, uh, eating good foods, basically focus on the food chain, eating all the foods necessary to having a healthy diet, and then using bologna sandwiches as a reward system growing up. And that trickled down to so many different other factors uh, during my development. Uh, positive reinforcement practices. One of the key things I tell parents and educators is that we truly need to meet these children where they are in their development. We need to establish a rapport with them because there is no one size fits all when it comes to these therapies and services. One thing that I will say, though, is I've seen many individuals with autism possibly impacted by cognitive behavioral therapy. And cognitive behavioral therapy is helping an individual who might have negative thoughts and going into a situation where they can think positively. And this is not something that only helps individuals with autism, but a wide range of special needs. And then finally, I think one of the, the factors that truly helped me growing up was self-advocacy self-advocacy. Once I got to college, I had no idea that I would not be receiving an individualized education plan anymore. So I went up to my disability support specialist and I said, hey, so uh, can you just hook me up with that uh, IEP and I'll be right out the door. And she said, Carrie, sit down and tell me for the first time about 504 reasonable accommodations. And I, I had to become a self-advocate for myself at this point. I highly recommend that parents have a formal conversation with their children mm -hmm. uh, as early as when they start school about their autism diagnosis so they can become their own best self-advocate for their services, but also as they transition to adulthood, they will be so much more well-prepared by having that formal diagnosis. I didn't know I had autism until I was 11 years old and it was life-changing when I found out I had autism because for so many years, I knew it was special, but I never knew what that meant towards my development. So being able to self-advocate is something we need to encourage these kids to do more and more of. And it was something that helped me tremendously. Now I quote, I have a quote called, autism can't define me and I define autism. And I hope that we can empower these kids to define their lives and their journeys in the way they best see it. So with, with that, I'll let uh, Amy speak about what helped her. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. Uh, you know, it was hard when I was thinking about what helped because when I was diagnosed, you know, there was not that awareness of autism that exists now. It was not in the national consciousness and so nobody really understood what it was. And this was, this was a new journey for my parents as well and for all of us. So we kind of bounced around and did different things. And, you know, it's like throwing spaghetti at the wall. You see what sticks. Um, so I did have a speech language pathologist when I was in middle and high school. Um, again, I would meet with her one-on-one -on -one and in groups. And the other kids who were in the group session were not on the spectrum. So what was being done was not specifically tailored to autism. So it was kind of, she would try to tailor it to me as much as she could. Um, so, but it's an interesting thing, you know, the things I remember most about meeting with her is the color of her lipstick um, and how it looked over her teeth and feeling the radiator behind me, which I would run my hand up backward and forward on for comfort. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's hard to say that what she was doing really helped that much, even though she was, of course, trying very hard. Um, it, it, because again, it was just, it was not specifically perhaps autism related, but I also had an occupational therapist, uh, which started when I was around 12, 12. <laughs> and um, what helped more than anything that she actually did with the school, because she did follow me around once or twice to observe what was happening in school. But what she did was introduce me to her daughter, who was three years younger than I was. And suddenly I had a friend um, which I really hadn't had. And 
again, I think perhaps the daughter being a little bit younger, that might have helped a little bit. Maybe also because her daughter was homeschooled. They were at the time they were very religious, so they were they, she was homeschooled and um, and I you know and I had this friend suddenly and it was it was a great wonderful thing. I mean, we, so you know, again, but that's not you know I'm in school six hours a day, five days a week, and so not having somebody there, it was still difficult in school. So it, it was really wonderful to have a friend uh, finally after not having one for quite a while. Um, Another thing that helped me, that helped me to express myself at the very least, was was writing. I, I began writing poetry when I was ten years old, um, and it was a way to express myself. It was the only outlet I really had um, at that particular point because I could not be myself in the real world with my peers. It was not accepted. So writing became this thing that I was able to channel so much of my myself into. And then as I got a little bit older, you know, around fourteen or so, I started writing stories. And I actually started writing erotic fiction because I had the same curiosities as my neurotypical peers, but again, no outlet, nobody to do typical things with. So writing about sex was how I learned about sex, um, which works in theory, not necessarily in practice, but that's a whole other PowerPoint. Um, but that writing was a great means of, of expression for me. And then I also started speaking at conferences when I was 14. Again. I can't really look at you and say that Amy Gravino as I am now existed back then because she didn't. She wasn't really a wholly realized person. And speaking at the conferences, it, it, for some reason, you know, the, the group that my mother is on the board of on Long Island called AHA and why Pat Schistel is the executive director, saw something in me and gave me the opportunity to speak on the team panels at their conference. And that was the beginning of my speaking career, essentially. Um, getting to to kind of do that even though I could not articulate myself you know to my peers face to face or maybe not even to my parents but when I would get up on that panel somehow I could do it there and I and that was I had no understanding of what that would lead to at the time obviously being 14 years old but now it's my profession and I can't imagine not doing it so that was a great early start for me to start finding my voice um at that particular point. And then of course, the, the greatest thing that helped me, I always say was my mother, because um, without her, I would not be here. I would not be giving this webinar to you right now. I would not be in the in the profession that I'm in. I would, I simply wouldn't be who I am without her. And, you know, I've always, I used to ascribe the word burden to myself. I always felt like I have been a burden to, to my parents and society kind of tends to look at autism as a burden in some ways. And very recently, you know, my mother, who now has Parkinson's, um, said to me, you know, that she feels like a burden. And it's kind of a cruel irony for that word to be revisited on me in this way. And um, I can only hope now that I am able to carry her in the way that she has carried me for so far and for so long. And, and just as she has always reassured me that I was never a burden to her, she is not a burden to me. So I am eternally grateful to my mother for everything she has done for me, and I always will be. So having the support of a parent is immeasurably invaluable for children on the spectrum, just knowing that someone is in your corner all the time. And it's not always the case, unfortunately. So I, I really owe so much to my mother. And this is just a little bit of contact information for anyone who would like to get in contact with us after this presentation today. If we don't get to one of your questions, feel free to connect with me and also Amy. These are the ways that you can do it. And just to go off at what Amy just said, uh, one, one thing that I, I like to end off uh, presentations by saying it's that uh, autism doesn't come with an instruction guide, but mm -hmm. it does come with a village that will never give up. Mm -hmm. uh, our, our parents were pivotal, me and Amy's parents were pivotal towards our development. So we are learning more about autism every mm -hmm. single day. So one thing that I could truly tell for everyone listening to this, whether you're a parent, you're an educator, a caregiver, a professional in the field, never give up. Mm -hmm. trying to learn more about autism and really just trying to connect where these kids are in their development because mm -hmm. for so long there was a stigma about autism when i was growing up it was every single person with autism was a boy and they would be like rain man and they would be able to turn 21 and be able to win you a lot of money <laughs> at the blackjack tables 
And we now know that autism is a spectrum. So get to know people with autism, figure out what their strengths and their challenges are, mm-hmm. and just try to meet them where they are every single day. And it's not about having all the answers. It's not about knowing exactly what the right thing to say is, because more often than not, there is no exactly right thing to say. I, what I always say to parents and to educators alike is dare to give a damn. Um, I remember distinctly the teachers, the people who gave a damn, who tried, even if what they did maybe didn't work completely, even if it wasn't 100% successful, at least they tried. And I remember the people who didn't, the people who looked away, who didn't even make an attempt to try to improve my life or my experience in school. So your, your children, your clients, your students will remember long from now whether or not you gave a damn and you tried. And if you mess up, it's okay. The fact that you're here attending this webinar shows that you want to learn, and that puts you far ahead of, of a lot of other folks. So don't be afraid to give a damn. And with that in mind, we will now say thank you, and we are, would be more than happy to answer any questions you have at this time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carrie and Amy. Uh, I really appreciate the, the valuable and very honest information. We're going to go ahead and take some time for questions now. And just a couple of reminders to please feel free to type your questions into the chat box. And also, please remember to fill out our evaluation at the link provided in the chat box. Um, so it looks like we, uh, we got some questions ahead of time. So let's go ahead to this. Um, the first question, uh, Carrie and Amy, is uh, what are the particular needs of adolescents as they transition into adulthood. We were hearing more and more about the um, importance of transition. What are your thoughts? And uh, make sure that you're unmuted. Hi. Uh, yeah, I think you're still muted right now. We're just unmuting the mics, so just give a second. Okay, I think you're unmuted. There we go. So, Carrie and Amy, can Hi, everyone. Does anyone have any questions? Hello, everyone. Okay, there they are. Oh, okay. So the first question is, um, what are the particular needs of adolescents as they transition into adulthood? What did, uh, thoughts do you have on that? You want to kick this off? <laughs> uh, well, you know, this is an interesting question because a lot of times the answer is going to depend on the adolescent. Like every person is different. Everyone is going to have kind of different needs that are going to need to be met. Um, but on the whole, one of, you know, the, the, the biggest kind of pieces is Obviously, employment, uh, finding ways to find employment and keep employment. Um, a lot of times people may need support with secondary education, be it college or be it a technical school, um, whatever it might be. And, uh, and, of course, some people may need support with relationships, with finding relationships and building relationships. And, um, but I think one of, the, one of the biggest things is that when you become an adult, suddenly your time is more your own. Right? When we're adolescents, it's more structured. Every, every you know where you're supposed to be at to watch classes as an adult you have to learn how to balance and handle your own time and that can be very very difficult um, for individuals on the spectrum so finding a, a way to really understand time management and figure out how to structure one's day without the benefit of a school system in place is i think one of the biggest support needs for autistic individuals. yeah and just to go off what amy just said also self-advocacy is truly truly crucial especially when we're talking about K through 12 and actually helping these kids transition throughout their entire lives, growing up on the autism spectrum, the importance of being able to self-advocate for yourself can never be uh, stressed enough. The ability to be able to learn things such as an IEP and be able to learn about that early on, to learn about the strengths and challenges that might accompany you in school but then also as you transition to adulthood, we always say early intervention is the key. And if we can learn self-advocacy skills for these and help these kids nurture the, their self-advocacy skills, 
it will help them tremendously throughout their entire life. Thank you. Um, another question uh, that we had is, how can we balance the need for accommodations with the need to develop resilience in children as they reach adulthood? And one thing I also wondered if you can comment about is, you know, when we talk about the full spectrum of autism, uh, that you know, that uh, people could range from needing quite a lot of supports uh, to being really quite independent. Um, you know, with keeping this in mind, um, you know, any tips about uh, balancing accommodations versus developing resilience? Sure. So I, I, I think it, just to answer kind of the second half of that question really quickly, I think it's an important topic that we bring up is that, as I mentioned in the webinar, if you met one person with autism, you met just that one person with autism. I think our media right now are currently focused a lot on high-functioning individuals with autism. We see this in portrayals from shows such as The Good Doctor on ABC, Atypical on Netflix, mm -hmm. of these very high-functioning individuals with autism. and. There are not a lot of representation of severe autism in our media. And I feel like a lot of the times we're, we're going and backtracking back to the 1980s with the movie Rain Man, and we're not necessarily seeing that severe autism actually being mentioned. There's a great resource that I would recommend for people watching this. Uh, she's a fabulous uh, woman of a severe child on the autism spectrum. Her name is Kate and she has a Facebook page called Finding Cooper's Voice, where she talks about severe autism and tries to actually educate those on severe autism. So that's one big, big thing. But just going to the other side of the question about actual accommodations and talking about the accommodations, one thing that we need to stress is really access to care because when we focus primarily on the NCHAT model and actually get these kids diagnosed as early as 18 months of age, which you can now do today, we can make sure that we are providing the right accommodations for every single child to get them because the first five years are essential and then actually helping them assess accommodations via an IEP via uh, also accommodations that come after these children age out school as well. We just need to do a better job of educating that autism is a lifelong disorder. And, and hopefully doing that, we'll be able to have legislators be able to actually provide more accommodations throughout the entire lifespan of autism. I agree with what <laughs> Carrie said. And it's interesting when we talk about resilience and individuals on the spectrum, I, somebody once said to me that someone said to them, oh, this is a professional, that autistic people aren't very resilient. And I think that's completely absurd. I think that we are kind of are more resilient than most people because we have to be, because we are trying to survive and thrive in a world that's not designed for us. And when we look at, you know, the balance of accommodations versus resilience, we do need to kind of ease back and maybe not do everything for autistic children. We create a sense of dependence that is not necessarily a good thing but by the same token sometimes we over focus on independence so to me the best thing to focus on is what i call what is called interdependence and what that means is that all of us go through life needing help with things nobody goes through this world goes through this life without needing help with one thing or another whether it's doing taxes or dry cleaning or whatever mm -hmm. it may be we all rely on other people for things so we we need to help autistic individuals find that balance between total dependence and total independence, which may not be completely possible for some people. And that shouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. The goal for each person should not be to be like every other person in the world. It should be to be the best version of themselves that they can be, whoever that is. Um, and, and the resilience, you know, again, like I said, that comes along with letting people make mistakes, letting people fall down, because otherwise, how will they be able to get back up? Um, and we all too often, we try to protect and insulate people on the spectrum from making mistakes and that that does the exact opposite of build resilience so um i i think that's one of the things that we definitely need to focus on okay those are great tips um you know you had mentioned bullying and uh, i think amy you specifically had said that uh it's probably really underreported. i was wondering as adults on the autism spectrum if you could comment about any tips that that you have for uh, managing bullying or 
how things might have um, come up in that regard for you? Well, I, I do think it's underreported, as I said, because a lot of times what happens is that individuals on the spectrum don't realize that they are being bullied. Uh, we don't always explain what bullying looks like. It, it's not just kind of the stereotype of, you know, someone's hair, kicking sand in their face or pushing them down on the playground. Bullying can be very, very subtle. It can be very nuanced. Um, and it can look like, you know, so oh, this person is, is talking to me. They're my friend. But no, they're actually making fun of you and you don't realize it. And that's a form of bullying. And, and that can be very hard to parse for kids on the spectrum. I know it was for me. Um, you know, there was a girl in elementary school who I desperately wanted to be friends with. And she would be really nice to me one day and then treat me like dirt the next day. And I just kept running back into the proverbial fire because I didn't understand um, what she was doing. And so kind of teaching people on the spectrum about what bullying is and what it can look like, but also not necessarily making us, putting the onus on us to, to stop the bullying because it shouldn't be, the burden shouldn't be on the victims of bullying to stop the bullies. And we, we do that very often. We say, well, if you would do this or act like this or do this, you wouldn't get bullied. But you know, bullies are always going to find something. It doesn't matter how well you think you fit in or what you do. If someone is going to be a jerk and be a bully, they're going to do that. And so we have to you kind of go to that source a little and, and stop bullying from the top and, and try to, you know, as, and it, it's difficult. But um, I, I think schools are starting to take bullying more seriously, but sometimes not always, you know, especially when it comes to folks who are, have a harder time reporting that bullying, like we said, and who are not always, you know, people in authority, right, they want to believe the bullies more because those are who they kind of identify with. They're not going to believe the underdog, the person being bullied, especially if it's somebody who's autistic, who they just can't relate to in that same way. That's human nature. So we need to have allies who can help us um, report that bullying and, and can help be our eyes and help us realize that we're being bullied if it's happening. And so it's complicated. It's, it's a you know, very difficult uh thing but hopefully those are some helpful tips yeah I, I i would say that most of the talks i do in k through 12 are focused on bullying prevention so i see many cases of bullying in the school systems today and one of the big things that i actually talk about when i speak about bullying is there are some amazing resources online to actually have a conversation about bullying especially in the school systems Stomp Out Bullying is an amazing, amazing organization that actually has several free toolkits that you can go on their website to actually learn a little bit more about how you can not only actually have a conversation about bullying in the school system, but actually how you could help individuals with special needs. One of the biggest things when we talk in K through 12 is about the importance of a strong peer mentoring program. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, because at the end of the day, we are learning, not only are we learning how prevalent bullying is today, but we're also learning about things such as isolation and how many individuals with special needs sometimes face isolation in school systems. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I recommend for every school system is to have a strong peer mentoring program starting at the age of five, even just doing things such as a six-year-old actually reading a book with a five-year-old to have that initial introduction, not only to make these kids feel less alone, but also have somebody to actually help them because it's been indicated time and time again when a peer intervenes in a bullying situation, it's more likely to stop completely versus an authority figure. So we need to do a better job of establishing peer mentoring programs, but then also acceptance-related events October is National Bullying Prevention Month, having speakers who, I was a victim of bullying growing up, having speakers actually talk about their own personal perspectives being bullied, and the ramifications that these actions can have on students. But then also at the same time, just to answer the whole bullying situation, it's not only in school age children. Bullying can happen at any time, mm -hmm. anywhere. Workplace bullying continues to be on the rise, That's cyber awesome. bullying continues to be on the rise. And then we also have to indicate teacher bullying as well, because that's something that's facing a lot of our special education students. Okay, great. Um, we have uh, time for one more quick question that came in, mm -hmm. and it was, do you have any suggestions for at what age um, 
that parents should start talking to their kids about the autism and letting them know uh, <laughs> uh, about autism and also uh, how this relates to building self-advocacy skills? Well, the, the importance of having that conversation, I didn't learn about my original autism diagnosis until I was 11 and a half. It's life-changing for me to, for years, knowing I was special, but never knowing what that meant. It gave me so much power. I, I, I started self-advocating for myself right away. I, for especially individuals with high functioning to uh, moderate, Autism, I recommend parents having that initial conversation as early as five years old when these kids are initially going into school. So they can sit in on their IEP meetings so they can actually know because un unfortunately in, in their digital age, I'm seeing more and more families saying they don't want their kid to be defined by a label. But then they go on, but then the kids go on social media and they see their mom, for example, doing an autism walk. And then they start having questions to themselves saying, wait a second, why, why is my parents doing this? So I think the earlier, truly the better. And if these kids feel that you know, autism is not necessarily a gift, because I know so many kids with autism who say, I wish I could be cured of my autism, show them positive role models in their community who have autism, the Amy Grafinos of the world, the Temple Grandins of the world, uh, to actually show that you know great things are possible in our community, especially in terms of our self-advocates. And then that will also encourage, at the same time, self-advocacy by seeing actual people with autism who are self-advocating for themselves today. Well, I, I was diagnosed at 11, um, the same age Kerry was when he found out, but I also found out at the same time that I was diagnosed. I was in the room when, when the psychologist told my parents, but at that age, it didn't really mean anything. Uh, to, you know, I didn't know that I was special. I knew that I was different and I knew that different was bad. And that was all that I knew at that particular point because I was being bullied and I was being picked on and I never, you know, I couldn't, because of my low self-esteem, I could see anything kind of positive in it. And um, so, but, but the relationship to the diagnosis will change over time. And I think the earlier that information is delivered, the, the sooner that relationship can begin and the child can begin to incorporate that piece of information into the data of who they are. It's not necessarily something that they'll define themselves by, but it, it is a vital piece of information that can help them understand themselves better, right? Because I hear this, especially from women who are diagnosed as adults, 30s, 40s, 50s, people go all these years of their life not knowing that this is what was going on, not knowing that this is why they struggled with certain things or why they maybe were really good at this particular thing or whatnot. So just, you know, you don't want your kid to go through 40 years of their life having no idea that this is the reason why they have, they're dealing with certain things. And obviously, you know, what you want them to use it as a crutch, but the, they have to be able to evolve that relationship with the diagnosis and be able to look at it and see where it fits into their life and where it fits into their sense of, of self. And as a teenager, I, I distanced myself from the diagnosis. I wanted nothing to do with it. I said, I hate this. If I didn't, have, you know, there's two Amy's. There's autism Amy and there's Amy Amy. And if autism Amy would go away, everything would be fine and I would be great. Um, and again, that was a function of the bullying I was experiencing and the low self esteem I had. But then as I got older, I realized no, there's only one Amy. There's only one. And yes, autism is part of who I am. It's not all of who I am. But I couldn't have made that conscious realization if I hadn't had that knowledge from the very early on, from the onset. So, um, I, yeah, I do think it's important to to let kids know and just say, like, this is what this is. And if you have questions, here's who you can talk to. And now, because of social media and the Internet, there are, like Carrie said, more role models people can look to. There are people on the spectrum on Twitter and online who they can see are thriving and, and living in the world and doing what they're doing. And that was not something that existed when I was a kid. There were, there were no older role models that I could really look to. And I didn't see what kind of a future I could have. I didn't think I could even have a future because of, of not having any visible you know, role model or idea that yes, there, you can make a life as someone who happens to be autistic. I didn't think that was possible. So I think kids now are in a much better place to do that than I was. And so I, I feel like that information should be imparted you know, in an age appropriate manner, obviously, but it should be imparted sooner rather than later. 
great points. Well, we can talk on and on, but our time is up. And I really want to thank uh, Carrie and Amy so much and also to thank everyone for listening. We really appreciate your participation. And we hope to see you at the next NJ ACE webinar, which is on Turning 18, Guardianship, Entitlements, and Waiting List. And that will be on Monday, June 3rd at 7 p.m. Thank you again so much for joining us today. Have a wonderful day.